Minerals, energy and agriculture, now more than ever, are vital to Australia's clean energy future, economic growth and prosperity. Since 2016, Geoscience Australia has applied science and technology in new ways through the Exploring for the Future program. By gathering, analysing and interpreting data at unprecedented scale and detail, we're building a national picture of Australia's geology and resource potential. So how do we know where to look for potential minerals, energy and groundwater buried deep underground? By analysing rock samples and water percolating up from below, measuring signals from earthquakes and lightning strikes, surveying and mapping with aircraft and seismic trucks. We are looking, listening, monitoring and recording what the Earth is telling us. We look across the country and image hundreds of metres below the surface to create a picture of what lies below our feet, resulting in a new generation of maps and data. Each set of data we acquire is valuable in itself, but when we overlay the data sets together in a way no one has done before, we start to see the full picture and gain a greater understanding of where we can make new discoveries. Australia has become a world leader in the science and innovation behind resource exploration. We're placing data directly into the hands of the people who need it. Governments and local decision makers, investors, explorers and regional communities. Supporting informed decisions that make a real difference to all Australians. We thank the people and communities who collaborate with us to ensure the success of our program. Together, our work is supporting the transition to a sustainable, clean energy future, building tomorrow's industries and stimulating regional economies to ensure the prosperity of future generations. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the first session of day three of the Exploring for the Future Showcase. My name is Christina Anastasi and I'm the branch head of the Advice, Investment Attraction and Analysis branch here at Geoscience Australia. And it is my pleasure to be your moderator today. Now, before we begin, I would like to start off with an acknowledgement of country. Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the people, the cultures and elders, past and present. At Geoscience Australia, we acknowledge that our mission to be the trusted source of Earth Sciences information is preceded by tens of thousands of years of knowledge gained by generations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of that wisdom and of the lands, waters and skies where we work, live and learn. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are Australia's original mappers, miners and navigators. This is the heart of our work. And we have so much to learn from their many thousands of years of related knowledge. Yesterday, speakers highlighted the extensive airborne electromagnetic data that is acquired by the program and the latest developments in the Exploring for the Future portal. We also heard about the work to improve access to geoscience information and the ways we engage with regional and remote communities. We also discussed our progress towards a national mapping of geology, geochemistry and minerals, as well as an overview of our early results from work in the Delamarian Arc. The work we are showcasing was only made possible through the extensive collaboration and we sincerely thank all our collaborators for their valuable contributions. Our first session today will highlight our research into mineral, energy and groundwater systems, including hydrogen storage potential. We will also examine mineral systems from isotopes to fluids, groundwater dependent ecosystems in the upper Darling River and the newly released Atlas of Australian Mine Waste. There will be a Q&A session 
following the presentations. You can ask questions of the presenters by using the Q&A stream, which you will find at the top of your screen. Please do not use the chat function. The speakers are presenting on behalf of a large team, including many scientists, administrators and other professionals. Please know if they cannot answer your question today, they will be happy to take it on notice and will respond via our email, eftf at ga.gov.au. Now, our first speaker today is Dr Andrew Feitz. Dr Feitz will talk about the role of salt caverns in Australia's transition to net zero. He is, a direct, he is the Director for Low Carbon Geoscience and Advice here at Geoscience Australia. He holds a PhD from the University of New South Wales and worked as a senior researcher in air and water treatment technologies at UNSW and the Carl Schrue Institute of Technology. Andrew is an environmental engineer and he has over 10 years research experience in the geological storage of CO2. Andrew leads hydrogen research for the Exploring for the Future program, including ongoing development of the Hydrogen Economic Fairways tool, iron mediated natural hydrogen production and science exploration for underground hydrogen storage. Over to you, Andrew. Thank you, Christina. It really is a pleasure to share with you some of Geoscience Australia's work supporting the hydrogen industry. For the last year or so, we have been drawing upon technical expertise from across our agency, geologists, geophysicists, engineers, and tapping into expertise outside our agency to understand Australia's potential for hydrogen storage in salt rock. I'm going to share the results of some of that work with you today. At last year's showcase, I talked about why we need underground hydrogen storage. Whether it's for a green steel plant, an ammonia plant, or loading ships, making sure that hydrogen is available 24 hours a day is critical. And for large scale storage, underground storage is the most practical and cheapest option. Almost 10 times cheaper than the equivalent above ground storage. Indeed, it is difficult to see the hydrogen industry reaching scale without low cost storage solutions. For storing gases underground, there are essentially two options widely used. Salt caverns or in porous rocks like sandstones. All large scale underground storage of natural gas in Australia is currently stored in sandstone rock, whereas hydrogen is commercially stored worldwide in salt caverns. As far as I am aware, there are no examples of pure hydrogen, of where pure hydrogen has been injected into depleted gas fields for storage although there are a number of pilot and demonstration plants planned, including in Australia. The properties of hydrogen make its storage in depleted gas fields a bit tricky and more research is definitely needed. I'm going to touch on storage in depleted gas fields later in this talk, but for now, let's focus on salt. There are currently four commercially operational salt storage facilities for hydrogen worldwide, three in the US and one in the UK, you can see that a lot of energy can be stored in a salt cavern. At Spindletop in the US, for example, the net energy storage is 274 gigawatt hours. That's twice the size of the planned Pioneer Burdekin pumped hydro energy storage project in Queensland, the Battery of the North, due to be completed in 2032. And that's just a single cavern. You could build multiple caverns at the one site. For the amount of hydrogen stored, about 6,000 tonnes, it also has a remarkably small footprint, as you can see in this photo of the Moss Bluff hydrogen storage facility in the US. Much of the infrastructure and tanks you can see are related to equipment for drying hydrogen when it is produced before injecting it back into a hydrogen pipeline. Compare that with the thousands of above ground tanks that would be required or thousand equivalent large scale battery installations and the case for underground storage of hydrogen is pretty compelling. Hydrogen storage in salt caverns is also considered by many the cheapest form to store hydrogen. It's also proven to be safe. Due to the demand for green or low emissions hydrogen, more salt caverns for hydrogen storage are currently under construction or planned around the world. The caverns are typically made by solution mining. You drill a hole into the rock salt and pump down fresh water to dissolve it. 
It's a lot more complicated than that, but it takes, but that's essentially the process. It takes about one to three years to make a cavern, depending on its size. Salt domes or diapirs are preferable because they often contain higher purity halite, and halite doesn't react with hydrogen. So where is the salt in Australia? We published a review of salt bearing basins a few months ago. The black dots show where halite has been recovered from drill cores at various locations across Australia. There are essentially two geological ages when thick salt was laid down in Australia, about 780 million years ago and about 400 million years ago. Based on this information, we can propose other regions in Australia where salt might be present, but hasn't been discovered yet. The area is in grey. These are pretty speculative, but might be worth having a look at. Based on what we know today, however, thick salt has been found in the Adavale Basin in Queensland, the Polder Basin offshore South Australia, the Amadeus Basin in Central Australia, and the Canning Basin in Western Australia. There is also strong evidence that thick salt exists in parts of the Bonaparte and Officer Basins, but we are unsure about the purity of the, of the salt in these regions because we don't have a lot of core. Around the same time that salt was being deposited in the Adavale Basin, about 400 million years ago, a lot of eastern Australia was covered by ocean. We know this through a variety of different clues, including the discovery of Devonian fish fossils, even in central Australia. This raises the possibility that if thick salt is found in the Adavale Basin, could it be deposited in other parts of eastern Australia, maybe even in New South Wales? There are main basins in eastern Australia that have never been drilled, so it is not outside the realm of possibility that there could be new salt discoveries. This is something we're quite interested in and we'll be investigating further. Okay, how would you find more salt? Well, one way is to look for unusual surface features. Here is a satellite image of the famous Woolno salt dive here on the lands of the Birrili Buru people in the Gibson Desert. It's about three kilometres in diameter and is a column of salt that has pushed its way through the overlying rock due to overburden pressure and has very slowly um, smashed its way through to the surface. It's pretty rare to see these at the surface though. More often than not, the salt is deeply buried underground like in the Adavale Basin. The salt here is located approximately 1.5 to 2 kilometres underground. Drill cores taken from the Adavale Basin contain some of the most spectacular examples of salt in Australia. You can see the original layered salt, the high purity salt um, halite that's been on the move, and the busted up and deformed rock above a salt dome. You can see that the rock in those photos is really quite deformed when it's above the salt. We have identified three major salt bodies in the Adavale Basin based on existing but limited seismic and well data, shown in purple on this slide. Some of that rock is over half a kilometre thick, but the area is pretty data poor and much of the old seismic is a bit shabby. So Geoscience Australia has just completed a massive regional seismic program through the Adavale Basin and adjoining basins under our data-driven discoveries program. This will give us fantastic insight into whether there is more salt in the basin and possibly shallower and more suitable salt for hydrogen storage. So look out for new data over the next 6 to 12 months. We think it is very likely that new salt bodies will be discovered. This seismic image is a good example. The Rosebank 1 well was drilled in 1984 looking for oil and gas, but at 1300 metres it hit salt and they drilled for 50 metres and then they gave up. Looking at the seismic, there appear to be huge salt structures below the well. It just goes to show how times have changed. Preserving that original data from a failed well from 40 years ago could potentially lead to construction of a salt cavern to support the clean energy transition. Resources that were once considered useless are valuable today. In many ways, like mine waste being revisited for critical minerals. Another technique you can use for looking for salt is gravity, in particular gravity gradiometry. Last year we released an EFTF extended abstract highlighting the storage potential of hydrogen in the Polder Basin. What we don't know is whether the salt we see in the offshore extends closer towards the onshore or is indeed even onshore. 
Working with Q integral, we have simulated the presence of salt onshore and modeled whether gravity gradiometry would be able to detect the salt. The answer in a nutshell is yes, and you can find the details in the accompanying EFTF abstract. We have undertaken a conceptual design for a salt cavern in the Adaval Basin, near the Berry One Well. At this location, the rock salt is over half a kilometre thick and almost pure halite. It is also at the right depth. While a lot more data is needed for a more detailed design, including an assessment of the rock mechanics, appropriate cavern geometry for the site and sizing of the bottom and roof pillars of the salt cavern, we estimate you could store up to about 6,000 tonnes of hydrogen in a single cavern. Details can be found in the accompanying EFTF abstract. But how much does it cost? We commissioned an experienced salt cavern construction company in Germany to provide us with an initial estimate for the size and depth of this particular cavern. Construction is surprisingly inexpensive, but we don't have good numbers on the water supply and brine disposal at this stage. Nevertheless, using an Australian cost factor, a single cavern at this location would cost in the order of about $100 million. That's about the same price as a large scale battery installation which are popping up everywhere, but around a thousand times more energy storage. It also is a lot cheaper than pumped hydro. Now let's turn to hydrogen storage in depleted gas fields. On the slide is a photo of the Iona, natural gas storage facility in Victoria, which provides seasonal storage of natural gas, particularly for Melbourne. It's topped up in the summer months when natural gas demand is low and drawn down in the winter to supply heating for the city. The gas is injected into the Warri sandstone, the red bit on the image, where the gas flows through tiny spaces in the sandstone rock. It's held in place by sealing rock, the Belfast mudstone. The example electron microscope images highlight the very low porosity and permeability of a mudstone compared to a sandstone, and it is these properties that provide a seal for the stored gas. Approximately 20 kilometres west of the Iona gas field is the CO2 CRC Otway International Test Centre. This CO2 storage demonstration site has been intensely studying and monitoring the movement of injected water and gas, in this case mostly CO2, in the subsurface for over 15 years, some of it in the same formation as used for the natural gas storage at Iona. We have used this rich data set to simulate injection of hydrogen into a depleted gas field. The figures are a little bit complicated, but illustrate an important consideration when using depleted gas fields for hydrogen storage. In the figure, red is hydrogen, green is nitrogen, our cushion gas, and blue is methane. The top figure is an example of when hydrogen is injected into the reservoir, and the lower figure is when it has been produced. The key observation is that when hydrogen is produced, not all of it comes out. There's still lots of red bits left, as you can see in the lower image. You can also see that there is plenty of blue or methane. A depleted gas field is depleted in pressure. It still has methane in it, although much less than when it started production. So the hydrogen that is recovered is not pure. It's a mixture of blue, green and red. Now this might be okay for some applications, but cleaning up the gas to make it pure hydrogen again could be expensive. This work is currently under a review in a journal and I would encourage you to check it out when it's published. It contains some uh, very useful findings. The extent of losses per injection cycle, even for a comparatively small project like this example, can no doubt be reduced through better design and well operation. The key limitation, however, is the rate at which you can inject and withdraw hydrogen. It is understandably much slower to withdraw hydrogen from a sandstone rock compared to withdrawing it from a cavity like a salt cavern. This leads to fewer cycles per year, resulting in a higher cost of storage for sandstone rocks and porous media. For more information, I've included a reference at the bottom of the page where we, with Monash University, have modelled the cost of this across Australia. The paper has been accepted for publication and should be coming out very soon. In conclusion, Australia does have thick salt accumulations that appear suitable for underground hydrogen storage. And this could be a significant commercial advantage for the Australian hydrogen industry. 
We also think it is likely that new salt bodies will be discovered once people start looking in known salt-bearing basins and maybe even discover completely new salt formations. Geophysics will be essential for new discoveries and decreasing the risk of unsuccessful drilling. But there is plenty of legacy data out there too that could be revisited and potentially guide new salt exploration. If you are interested in looking at particular samples from our core holdings, please contact our repository through ausgeo at GA and they can arrange to have data made available for viewing. It's free and we welcome visitors to our facility. Finally, a big thank you to the hydrogen team and all our collaborators over the last year. Thank you. Well, thank you, Andrew, for a great talk on the use of salt caverns and depleted gas fields for hydrogen storage. Now, just a reminder, please add your questions in the, in the Q&A panel on the top of your screen and include the name of the presenter you'd like to ask, and we'll get to these in the Q&A session later on. Now, our next speaker is Dr. Evgeny Baskotrov, who will present on basin-hosted base metal deposits, new mineral system insights from stable isotopes, inorganic geochemistry, and thermodynamic modelling. Evgeny is a senior geochemist here at Geoscience Australia, leading the Geochemistry for Basin Prospectivity module in the Exploring for the Future program. Holding a PhD in Earth Sciences from the Australian National University, Evgeny has devoted 25 years to Geoscience Australia. He has contributed to a holistic understanding of load gold, iron oxide, copper gold, uranium, porphyry and salt lake mineral systems. His expertise also extends to groundwater and regolith geochemistry. Now, Evgeny ran the highly successful Northern Australia Geochemical Survey. He is currently focusing on the geochemistry of critical minerals, including data analysis and modelling. Over to you, Evgeny. Thank you very much for the introduction, Christina. So today I will be talking about new mineral system insights for basin hosted base metal uh, deposits based on combination of inorganic geochemistry, stable isotope data and uh, thermodynamic uh, modeling. Geochemistry for Basin Prospectivity module within the FTF program has two major goals. First, to investigate mineral potential of selected Australian basins for basin-hosted mineralization, namely lead, zinc, silver, and uh, copper cold, cobalt. And uh, secondly, to create a geochemical toolkit to enable rapid mineral potential assessment of Australian basins. During EFTF stage one, we focused on the Makassar Basin uh, Mount Hazer area, and uh, the results were discussed uh, and reported already. And uh, the current stage of the project uh, uh, devoted to the geochemistry of uh, Neoproterozoic rocks of Stewart Shelf uh, region in South Australia. We designed our geochemical sampling program and interpretation based on mineral system approach suggested by Leslie Wyvern and the uh, courses back in 94. So instead of looking at a separate mineral deposit, we're actually looking at the whole set of geological factors that control generation and preservation of mineral deposit, looking at metal sources, ligand sources, fluid sources and energy sources, fluid pathways, threats for mineralization and depositional mechanisms, and finally, outflow zones. What is practically important is that mineral system itself has a much larger geological and geochemical footprint compared to a separate mineral deposit. So it's actually uh, much easier to pinpoint uh, within the big uh, geological area. And a particular case for a mineral system for sediment host at the lead zinc deposit. It provided here based on the model by Houston et al. published in 2006. Using this one as a guide, we focused on background geochemistry and variability within particular uh, stratigraphic units, looking at potential source of metals, uh, ligands, and fluids. We focused mostly on uh, poorly sampled units that are unmineralized or weakly mineralized. 
And uh, basically, this new data set, they complement very rich existing data on mineralized and organic rich intervals. And when collected, we can look at the whole uh, data in its all entirety. So this map here gives you an idea about the spatial extent of the sampling. And uh, the samples, uh, they actually all come from the drill holes to ensure that we are dealing with the uh, fresh, non-weathered uh, material. And here is a summary of previous results and the new work. So basically, during EFTF stage one, we got uh, results for more than 800 samples uh, for inorganic and uh, partly organic geochemistry. Uh, those were discussed by champion and co-authors back in uh, 2000. We also completed some uh, geochemical inversion model uh, to help us constrain the sources of mineralizing fluids. But this part was uh, uh, never discussed in detail in uh, public. And also this data were complemented by mineralogical and stable isotope data that were only partially acquired uh, during the end of the stage uh, one. Finally, we've got some new data on rubidium strontium and lead-lead geochronology for altered uh, mafic rocks. So basically, I will focus on uh, uh, these uh, three last items here. So what was the major results from the inorganic geochemistry study? First of all, we established basin-wide alteration and uh, metal uh, leaching. So there is a whole number of different alteration types, but the most prominent is potassium alteration. And we can see that we have significant gains of potassium content compared to primary mafic rocks uh, potassium content. And uh, it's uh, basically widespread for different uh, uh, rock groups and uh, different age uh, groups. This alteration is also accompanied by significant losses in uh, base metals. For example, here there is a plot of uh, zinc loss. So we can basically demonstrate that within the whole uh, large-scale basinal system, uh, we have uh, available source rocks, and uh, this uh, leached zinc and uh, other base metals, they should have been uh, deposited elsewhere. But all this rich geochemical data, they can be essentially collapsed in one or two box whiskers plot. So basically, each box plot would uh, relate to a few hundred analyses for a particular analyte, and uh, we can look the whole data set at once. So the way we, we present data here, they're all normalized to fresh non-altered rock. So it might be a rock from this particular area if there is available one. It was not the case for our study though. Here we used a reference rock from uh, essentially a textbook one. Uh, it's a corrode delirite from Africa that uh, would closely resemble uh, the analyzed uh, mafic rocks here. But what we can see that we have actually huge ranges of gains and losses for a number of elements. In this particular case, the most prominent would be potassium, hydrogen uh, expressed as a, a loss of ignition, sodium, calcium, and magnesium. And also we can see the major trends, whether we just have a, a predominant loss or predominant gain for a particular component, and uh, we can also apply the method to the O elements as well. So, for example, in this case, we have significant losses of uh, copper and zinc and more complicated behavior of lead. But again, it can be accompanied by either loss or gain. So what's important here that uh, the mobile elements can be used for classification of alteration assemblages. And we can actually use the unsupervised cluster analysis to discriminate between them and why it's important and useful, I will uh, elaborate in a few minutes from now. So basically to establish the nature of fluids uh, responsible for this alteration, we applied numerical thermodynamic model. The model itself uh, in a way is uh, pretty uh, simple. It's a step flow through reactor model. You can imagine that we have a pipe that actually stuffed with a uh, fresh mafic rock and we pump a number of fluid batches through it and monitor what happens to our rock. The overall uh, chemical system is quite complicated, though the physical model is uh, uh, simple, and we can test the scenario for multiple fluid uh, compositions. So what would happen during this fluid rock interaction? So if we are looking at isothermal process, according to the theory of metathermatic zoning, 
we will develop a number of distinct mineral zones that will grow and travel while our fluid infiltrate through the rock column. So basically, we can monitor what kind of mineralogical changes we'll have down the fluid flow. So the plot on the top actually shows the changes in overall mineralogy in terms of major uh, rock minerals. But we can also monitor what happens to our trace elements. For example, uh, the plot below shows what could happen to zinc. So if we have fluid uh, unsaturated originally with uh, zinc sulfides, it would leach zinc, but it would also be deposited down the fluid paths. So it basically illustrate, illustrates the fact that within the same mineral system, we can have both losses and gains of our ore components. So what's important here that each zone is characterized by its own distinct mineralogy and its own distinct bulk rock geochemistry. So from the modeled mineralogical composition, we can reconstruct bulk chemical composition. And in ideal case, if we project this data on simple bivariate geochemical XY plots, each zone would produce a very distinct point. In real situation, of course, when we're dealing with natural assemblages, the situation is more complicated. First of all, because um, replacement reactions, they never go to uh, completion. Also, we hardly deal with isosomal infiltration. So basically, the boundaries between our zones, uh, they will be fuzzy, uh, not sharp and distinct. Finally, we have uh, some uh, dispersion in original uh, rock compositions uh, of our process protolith, plus some uncertainties associated with geochemical analysis. All this results in the fact that if we sample distinct uh, uh, mineralogical zones, uh, we'll have a cluster of points, but not a point. But it still provides us a useful ideology how we can examine the goodness of our feet. For example, we run a model. We produce these discrete points. We can compare it with the uh, cluster distribution on our diagrams. And uh, we can basically assign the probability of our modal point belonging to a particular cluster. So basically, we could see how good is each of these points. And then we can assign overall probability of our reaction points uh, belonging to a particular alteration pattern. This way, by running multiple models, uh, we can actually rank them in terms of the likelihood. So it just illustrates the whole idea. For example, here I've got a subset of chemical analysis that's been clustered using this approach. Then uh, we outline the calculated reaction path. And uh, for each model, we can actually have a model ranking. OK, so our collaborator from CSRO, Carolee Siegel, uh, she ran a few hundred models with different fluid compositions, uh, looking essentially at the distribution of components within uh, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and uh, sodium space for a number of FO2 and uh, pH uh, values. And uh, basically what we have, OK, we can have this uh, example of theoretical grid of compositions. So we run this one-dimensional model for each of them. Then we estimate the goodness of fit, and each of these points can be colored accordingly to its suitability. And we can even sort of approximate this distribution by a Kriegen plot just to get a quick visualization of results. So the results are that the best performing models favor potassium-rich and calcium-rich fluids, or potassium-rich and calcium-poor fluids. And this enrichment in potassium might have resulted from sourcing of the fluids either from extremely evolved evaporitic brines or with fluids that experience interaction with felsic rocks prior to alteration with basalts. And it actually provides a nice link to stable isotopes here. First of all, just a quick map of what's been sampled in terms of uh, stable isotopes, so carbonates for oxygen and carbon, then silicates for oxygen and deuterium. And finally, there is uh, one drill hole that was sampled for geochronology as well. So what do we have in terms of oxygen-hydrogen systematics? So if we put our reconstructed fluid compositions against classification fields 
for modern day brine or hypothetical magmatic water, we can see actually that our data set is consistent with modern coastal evaporative enrichment, or it may be associated with the uh, seawater evaporation trend. So basically, our stabilizer of data is quite consistent with what I just presented uh, by the use of thermodynamic uh, modeling. Now, if we look at uh, carbon oxygen uh, isotopes in uh, uh, carbon nitrox, we can predict what distribution would be if our calcite and dolomite would be in equilibrium, because we actually looked separately at isotopic composition of calcite and dolomite by uh, selective liberation of CO2 from these two minerals. But in fact, we see a big uh, disequilibrium trend. So basically, it means that we are dealing with the replacement of uh, dolomite by introdu introduction of magnesium uh, uh, rich brines. And in terms of geochronology, okay, so we have uh, a few results for rubidium, strontium, and uh, uh, lead isotopic data. And uh, we have uh, alteration ages about uh, 13, 35 million years. And again, from uh, Lead, lead data around uh, 1430 to 1405 million years. So it's basically our uh, upper uh, age limit for alteration. So that's basically the summary of uh, new and uh, old learnings, uh, everything that I just uh, described above. And now just a very quick overview of the preliminary stewart shelf results. Again, there is a map that illustrates the sample drill holes. Uh, once again, we'll provide a box whiskers plot of uh, normalized uh, chemical analysis. We can see that uh, the alteration degree here is much less than in the case of the Makasa Mount Isa area. Nevertheless, we still have uh, some gains of uh, potassium and hydrogen and a lot of calcium. And in terms of all elements, we have loss of copper, but not loss of lead and zinc. That basically means that we are dealing with potential source rock for copper, but uh, we might expect copper cobalt mineralization, but probably not lead zinc one, because basically not uh, much lead and zinc were mobilized in the first place. And if you want to compare these two regions here, we can actually see the difference of these uh, box plots brought to, together. So here are the overall conclusions. Basically, original scale geochemical assessment of potential source rocks allow identification of basin scale prospectivity for lead zinc and copper cobalt systems. For greater Makasa basin, we observe extreme degrees of basin scale alteration of mafic rocks with concomitant loss of metals. And uh, as a result of loss of lead, zinc, and copper, it's prospective for all these uh, three elements. And preliminary data for Stuart Shell suggest lesser degrees of alteration of mafic rocks and co concomitant loss of copper, but not lead. We have prospectivity for copper and potentially for cobalt. And uh, we have ongoing uh, rapid assessment of trap rocks. So basically watch this space. And I want to acknowledge contributions from the uh, state service, our collaborators from CSRO, the University of Melbourne for Isotopic Analysis and Geoscience Australia Laboratory staff. Thank you. Thank you, Evgeny, for providing that comprehensive overview and sharing fundamental insights into mineral systems. Now, our next speaker in this session is Dr. Sarah Buckerfield, who will present a case study from the Upper Darling River floodplain. Sarah is a hydrogeologist in the groundwater geoscience section. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Geology and Chemistry from the Australian National University and a PhD on hydrological and land use controls on groundwater contamination in southwest China. Her focus is on the integration of multidisciplinary data sets to provide groundwater systems understanding for sustainable water resource management, but at any given time would probably rather be doing field work. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Sarah. Thanks for listening. Um, I'm really pleased again to be presenting a groundwater dependent ecosystem component of our Upper Darling floodplain groundwater project. The aims of this work were firstly to uh, contribute to the ongoing development of methods um, to characterise and map groundwater dependent ecosystems and secondly, to um, provide some outputs 
that could be used to potentially improve the mapping of groundwater dependent ecosystems in this region. Uh, this has been a collaborative effort, so I am presenting on behalf of all of my wonderful co-authors um, at Geoscience Australia, CSIRO, New South Wales, DPE, and also a lot of others inside and outside the organisation who've helped us along the way. So this groundwater dependent ecosystem um, assessment is just part of a larger groundwater system study. We're working up here in the Upper Darling floodplain um, in northwestern New South Wales between um, approximately Burke and Wilcannia in the Murray-Darling Basin to improve understanding of groundwater systems. Uh, this area has experienced critical ongoing water shortages, um, water quality issues, ongoing ecological decline, as I'm sure we've all seen in the news over the years. Um, so there's really strong imperative to understand whether groundwater could provide um, an alternative or supplementary water supply, and um, also the ongoing need to improve our understanding of groundwater surface water systems across the Murray-Darling Basin. Groundwater dependent ecosystems are relevant um, because ecosystems along the Darling River, um, as is the case for most dry land river systems in Australia, have adapted to depend on the groundwater um, during dry periods. So um, this is just an example of what one of those key groundwater dependent ecosystems looks like in this region. So it's the riparian zone around the Darling River. Um, and this is a river red gum, which will have deep tap roots going down to up to 30 metres to reach the water table, um, which it can rely on during no and low river flow periods. Um, this is just a, an image of a similar niche in the ecosystem also in the riparian zone, um, which is not doing so well. Um, so there's a need here and also across Australia more broadly to improve our ability to um, identify uh, and characterise the condition of groundwater dependent ecosystems um, in order to allow us to improve our management. We're lucky in this region in that um, previous work has been conducted assessing the likelihood of groundwater dependence um, of ecosystems across the study area. And that's been incorporated into the Bureau of Meteorology's Groundwater Dependent Ecosystem Atlas. So that provides us with a uh, comparative data set um, for the more novel methods that we've been testing. Our conceptual understanding of the dominant process underpinning um, groundwater dependent ecosystem distribution uh, and condition is that during high flows, the Darling River recharges a freshwater lens of variable geometry in the surrounding alluvium. Um, primarily through bank exchange and overbank flooding processes, and this will raise the water table. During low flows, the Darling River level water level drops more rapidly than the groundwater table, and groundwater discharges into the Darling River, um, which you can see occurring in this photo over here, um, which we took in March this year as the Darling River level dropped off. During this process, the water table will lower, um, and species in the ecosystem um, have been adapted to cope with a certain amount of decline, um, but be, will be adversely impacted um, if that is exceeded. So there's a need to um, better integrate remote sensing methods, which um, provide excellent spatial coverage um, with ground-based methods, which validate um, whether remote sensing signal is uh, actually reflecting an ecosystem that accesses groundwater. So um, in this study, we tested multiple remote sensing methods that uh, reflect three different properties often related to ecosystems having a constant source of water. Um, and those were greenness um, and moisture content across the landscape, and then vegetation structure. Um, firstly, we tested an optical imagery derived product, various permutations of the tasseled cap percentile products, which are available uh, with national coverage through Digital Earth Australia at a resolution of 25 metres. Uh, the tasseled cap transformation is a principal component analysis of the six Landsat bands and the tasseled cap percentile products provide statistical summaries of the greenness, um, moisture content or wetness and brightness in the landscape during dry, average and wet conditions. So this can be useful for detecting groundwater dependent ecosystems when they are more persistently green um, or wet than ecosystems relying on ephemeral surface water flows or rainwater. Secondly, we tested various products derived from Sentinel-1 synthetic aperture radar imagery at a resolution of 15 metres, which is pretty good. Um, this is an active remote sensing platform. So the sensor produces its own energy, which interacts with the earth uh, and then measures how much of that energy is returned. 
it's been shown that uh, vegetation type and structure can affect the intensity and coherence of the return signal, um, particularly for wavelengths of approximately five centimetres. So similar to greenness or wetness in optical imagery, um, vegetation with access to groundwater often maintains a more consistent structure through time, which results in the properties of the return radar signal being more consistent. Lastly, we assessed at a selection of sites um, of different vegetation communities, whether a metric of um, canopy greenness, the normalised difference vegetation index known as the NDVI, was most strongly correlated with um, surface water, groundwater or soil moisture availability. Um, so this provides us a measure of the likely importance of groundwater to vegetation communities and is a first step in tying that remote sensing signal to um, groundwater availability. So we found the most informative product from the um, tasseled cap data sets was a combination of the 10th percentile greenness and wetness products, which provide the lowest 10% of values for each pixel for the 30 year Landsat data record. So this provides us a picture of the relative greenness and wetness across the landscape during the driest periods. We found that uh, splitting the range of values across the study area um, for both greenness and wetness by half standard deviation increments produced excellent discrimination between a range of groundwater dependent ecosystems uh, and non-groundwater dependent ecosystems. Um, the classes produced by this discretization are represented by the coloured scale bars. Um, so we've got increasing wetness and increasing greenness with both high wetness and greenness in the dark colours on the bottom right. On the resultant map of the whole region, um, we can see the floodplain classified as low to moderate wetness. So that's a big blue streak coming diagonally across, um, while the surrounding hill slopes are higher on the greenness scale, reflecting the very different soil types and vegetation communities. Zooming into the riparian zone around the river, um, we can see two known groundwater dependent ecosystems being well uh, delineated using this product. Um, so the river red gums mapped in the groundwater dependent ecosystem atlas shown inside the yellow boundary show up as high greenness and wetness using the tasseled cap classification scheme, um, while Coolabar, River Coobar uh, are showing up as high wetness and moderate, moderate greenness. So that's the cyan colours. This is likely um, due to their greyer foliage cover. You can see that there is some discrepancy between uh, the groundwater dependent ecosystem atlas polygons and um, the areas selected by the tasseled cap percentile discretization, which is likely due to the tasseled cap percentile products being at 25 metre resolution compared with the MODIS data used for the groundwater dependent ecosystem atlas, which is at a 250 metre resolution. Um, so this indicates that the tasseled cap percentile products could potentially be used to improve the mapping of groundwater dependent ecosystems um, in this region and definitely warrants being tested elsewhere. And if you're interested in testing out um, this method for yourself, um, there's some links there to the Digital Earth Australia portal with the data and the scripts that we used on GitHub. Of the radar derived indices, the coherence um, or the amount of scattering of the return radar signal during dry conditions proved to be the most useful index for detecting probable groundwater dependent ecosystems. Um, this map shows the inverse of the coherence of the return signal um, with high values in red indicating low coherence and blue indicating high coherence. Um, this would suggest that heavily vegetated areas, which in this region are most likely to be GDEs, are producing more scattering. Uh, when compared with the existing mapping presented in the GDE Atlas and approximately um, an appropriate threshold set in the coherence scale, we found that this index was able to correctly identify um, 48% of areas classified as high potential of groundwater dependence and 91% of areas classified as um, low or high potential. Um, so it's performing quite well. So with multiple remote um, sensing indices harnessing different properties uh, often exhibited by groundwater dependent ecosystems, um, overlaying them can produce increased confidence in um, their likelihood. Um, so this map shows pixels that were classified as high likelihood of groundwater dependence um, using one, two or three of the radar, greenness and wetness indices developed in this study. Um, and as you can see, there's good agreement in areas we would expect, such as the riparian zone around the river. Um, so this could be performed with any number of remote sensing indices available to increase confidence in GDE identification. Across the 16 sites where we had uh, groundwater level, surface water level and soil moisture data available, uh, we saw strongest correlation between the NDVI um, and groundwater or river levels and weaker correlation with soil moisture. 
Um, this is one example of a site classified as uh, Coolabar open wetland um, with moderate potential of being groundwater dependent. Um, so you can see on this map uh, the location of the polygon um, over which we extracted the NDVI time series, um, groundwater monitoring bore with groundwater level data, the river gauge with surface water level, and then soil moisture was taken from um, the Bureau of Meteorology's Australian Landscape Water Balance Model. The time series uh, cross-correlation analysis um, showed that the NDVI was most strongly correlated with groundwater level at almost no time lag. So um, on these plots we have time lag and strength of correlation and the strongest correlation was um, at approximately no time lag for groundwater. Um, in contrast, it was more weakly correlated with river levels at a time lag of approximately four months and um, even more weakly correlated with soil moisture, again at a time lag of four months, which is what we would expect um, for an ecosystem with very little rainfall. Um, so this tells us that groundwater is highly likely to be the most important water source for this vegetation. The direction uh, of the time lag in the correlation also supports our conceptual understanding of the system. Um, suggesting that the dominant process occurring uh, over this time period is high river flows recharging the groundwater system, um, which is then utilised by the riper riparian zone ecosystem. Um, so this, uh, along with other lines of evidence, underscores the importance of considering the surface and groundwater systems as one system when managing water resources. The key conclusions from this work um, were that the tasseled cap percentile products could um, potentially be used to improve mapping of groundwater dependent ecosystem boundaries in this region um, and tested elsewhere. We uh, improved um, the confidence in the level of groundwater dependence of vegetation communities across the floodplain by drawing on um, multiple properties with different remote sensing methods as well as the time series data. The indices derived from um, radar data did prove to be suitable for mapping GDEs in this region um, and with improving accessibility to this data it could become um, one of the remote sensing methods in the toolbox of techniques available to assess likelihood of groundwater dependence. And then lastly, the most important next step in this work is to uh, integrate the remote, remotely sensed metrics and measures of water availability um, with actual metrics of vegetation and ecosystem condition. I've just presented a small subset um, of the work uh, conducted in this assessment. Um, so if you're interested in more detail, uh, follow this DOI for the report. Um, we'd also love to hear from you if you've got questions or suggestions. Um, so please don't hesitate to get in touch. Uh, and thanks so much for, for listening. Well, thank you, Sarah. As always, an insightful talk. Now, our final speaker for this session is Jane Thorne. Jane is a geologist leading the National Mine Waste Assessment Activity for the Exploring for the Future program. Jane holds a Bachelor of Science in Geology and has postgraduate experience in geochronology. She joined Geoscience Australia in 2012 as a project geologist and has worked on a range of national and regional scale pre-competitive mineral system studies and data releases. Jane is currently leading an investigation into the secondary prospectivity of critical metals in Australia's mine waste. Over to you, Jane. Thank you for joining us today and allowing me to tell you about the exciting work we have been doing to discover the opportunities that Australia's mine waste may hold. I present this work on behalf of myself, my team and our project partners. For a number of years, the Australian Government has recognised that resource scarcity is a significant risk to critical mineral supply chains. Australia's newly released Critical Minerals Strategy sets out a framework and prioritises six focus areas to grow Australia's critical minerals sector and seize the opportunities of the clean energy transition thanks, in part, to Australia's rich geological reserves. To enable us to meet global critical mineral needs, Australia will need a pipeline of new supply sustainably developed to create sovereign capability. There should be a focus on social outcomes, particularly for First Nations and regional communities whilst achieving net zero by 2050. All Australian state, territory and federal governments continue to invest in government-funded geoscience programs to provide data, 
information tools and new thinking about our geological endowment. This will empower mineral explorers and lower exploration risk in new regions, including critical minerals. This also includes rethinking the value proposition of our existing tailings and rock dumps. As a leading global supplier, Australia has hundreds of active and historic mines and mineral processing operations with associated storage facilities and rock dumps. These potentially contain significant amounts of untapped critical minerals, as well as strategic mineral resources, which may provide commercial and strategic opportunities that could be combined with positive environmental outcomes. The National Mine Waste Assessment provides accurate geospatial and economic information about Australian mine waste sites and processing facilities. By using mineral systems understanding and understanding geochemical correlations, we aim to be able to predict site-specific critical mineral prospectivity and by integrating economic modelling, this work will support the development of Australia's reprocessing capabilities for both extraction and modern management of mine waste. Of course, reprocessing is not a new concept and there are some good examples in Australia of successful retreatment, including operations here at Century Mine in Queensland and Hellier Mine in Tasmania. While excellent examples of successful reprocessing in Australia, both are examples where retreatment has primarily targeted base metal recovery and demonstrates that Australia has yet to fully explore the opportunities of critical and other strategically important minerals in our mine waste. This got us thinking, what are the opportunities for critical mineral recovery from mine waste and what can Geoscience Australia do to support these opportunities? However, in order to do this, first we need to know where Australia's mine waste is and how it is stored. In May this year, we released the first phase of the Atlas of Australian Mine Waste, which is now available at the link on the screen. The Atlas provides accurate geospatial and operational information about mine and processing waste sites for more than 1,400 sites across Australia and would have to be one of the most comprehensive of its kind anywhere in the world. As we continue to learn more about Australia's mine waste, we will update the Atlas with more locations, form new critical and commodity associations, and improve the functionality in subsequent phases of its development. When we zoom in from a national scale, as I have here to Mount Isa in far north Queensland, you can see each facility is marked. With the help of researchers at RMIT University, this Atlas allows us to individually view each storage facility and obtain a summary of publicly known information about that specific feature, including information about the waste type, such as tailings as seen in this example, how the waste is stored, the mine or deposit the material has come from, and information about the geological deposit models, if known, where the material's origin is known, the feature is color coded to the known resource commodities from that deposit. Knowing where our mine waste is located nationally is just the first step in helping us realise its potential as a secondary source for critical and other minerals. To understand the potential for valorisation, we need to understand the chemical and mineral characteristics of the mine waste at locations around Australia. To do this, we have partnered with the University of Queensland, RMIT University, as well as the State and Territory Geological Surveys to undertake a national mine waste assessment and analysis campaign. Researchers are sampling to geochemically and mineralogically characterise waste at sites across Australia in order to understand its composition and what critical minerals may be in our waste. Understanding these characteristics will help researchers and industry utilise existing processing technologies and innovate new technologies to extract critical minerals in the future. As part of the Exploring for the Future program, Geoscience Australia has committed to funding as many as 19 sites across Australia. This sampling complements the numerous state and territory funded programs highlighted in the image here. 
To date, a little over 90 sites across Queensland, the Northern Territory, New South Wales, South Australia and Tasmania are being assessed for their metal content and concentrations. In the next few slides, I'm going to show you highlights from three of these sites. This could not be achieved without the existing partnership that we have with our universities and state and territory geological surveys. These partnerships are crucial to begin a national conversation focused on unlocking the opportunities to diversify supply chains. I will now spend some time to give high level overviews of Geoscience Australia's first three detailed sites undertaken by researchers at the University of Queensland. The Eloise Copper Mine is situated in Queensland's Northwest Minerals Province, approximately 150 kilometres southeast of Mount Isa. Eloise is an Ernest Henry type copper gold deposit. The mine's primary metal production is copper and gold. However, this deposit also hosts and produces some silver. Perhaps one of the standouts from the results here is the importance of mineral characterization. As shown in the middle images, the bulk geochemistry shows relatively low cobalt and nickel concentrations. However, the detailed mineral characterization from this site shows that pyrotite and pyrite are highly endowed in these metals. In pyrite, for example, the average cobalt concentration is a little over 3,300 parts per million. This suggests that further detailed investigation of the pyrite should be undertaken to examine the resource potential of cobalt and explore potential reprocessing methods to liberate the sulphide particles. Our second example is the Cannington Silver and Lead Mine, which is also situated in Queensland's Northwest Mineral Province, approximately 200 kilometres southeast of Mount Isa. Cannington is a sediment hosted siliclastic mafic zinc lead deposit. The mine's primary metal production is silver and lead. However, the deposit also hosts significant zinc and some minor copper. This study concentrated on results from the mine's cell one tailings dam. As shown, the bulk geochemistry reveals good distribution of rare earth elements across the tailings dam. The schematic on the right shows that the vertical distribution of rare earth element concentration increases with depth. Although in-depth mineral characterization was unable to be studied at this site, these results suggest targeted investigation of rare earths in silicates should be carried out. Our final example is Zeon, located in northwest Tasmania. The smelter was operational from 1896 to 1913 and processed ore from local granite-related vein deposits and volcanic-hosted massive sulphide deposits. These mines mainly targeted lead and silver with minor zinc and copper recovery where possible. There are two slag piles at the site, the north and south piles, with the tailings located to the south of these highlighted in the red circle in the upper image. The bulk geochemical results of the tailings show moderate to high concentrations of a number of deposit related critical minerals, including antinomy, with concentrations of up to 730 parts per million. Mineral investigations demonstrate that antinomy, along with manganese and bismuth, are concentrated in galena. Whilst this site is relatively small, the in situ mineral investigations also demonstrates that pyrite is highly liberated enriched in gold and is unlikely to require regrinding. Further investigation is warranted to determine the potential for economic recovery and site rehabilitation. Achieving metal recovery from other sites requires more in-depth metallurgical testing. As you can see from what I have covered in this talk so far, our work under the National Mine Waste Assessment has been largely focused on answering the first two questions on this slide with our main activities being the development and publication of the Atlas of Australian Mine Waste and the rollout of the National Mine Waste Sampling Campaign. As the Exploring for the Future program enters its final year, our focus is now shifting to include the third question on this slide, namely the economic viability of reprocessing. 
This will include an assessment of potential environmental, social and governance outcomes, as well as legislative considerations. But it is basic economic modelling, the combination of mineral grade and character with ore body tonnage, that will be fundamental to determining which mine sites could be economically processed for critical minerals. To this end, we have partnered with Monash University to model, as a first step, mine waste volume utilising satellite data. Satellite and aerial images provide an historic record of tailings dam growth. Using this record, colleagues at Monash University are prototyping image segmentation algorithms to estimate tailing dam growth through time to better understand volume. Early results are promising, with the method successfully segmenting the tailings dam and seepage around the dam from the surrounding landscape as highlighted in the time series on the far side. This enables us to estimate the change of extent with time. To obtain volume estimates, we need to link these with elevation models. In this example, volume estimates can be obtained for this wet stack dam from digital elevation models as they are available at the beginning of the tailing dam's construction. The bottom image shows the dam volume estimates by intersecting the mapped extent with the height of the dam. This gives us insights into the volumetric change of tailings through the life of the mine. This could be validated against, for example, historical production data. From this work, we hope to establish methods to estimate tailing volumes to inform potential resource values. Of course, as I've previously mentioned, this work has not been achieved alone. I would like to thank the long list of colleagues at Geoscience Australia, our colleagues at the University of Queensland, RMIT University, and Monash University for their tireless work, as well as our state and territory geological survey counterparts. We are also very grateful for the mining companies who have allowed us access and provided support to our researchers on their sites. Without their participation, this work would not have occurred. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jane. I actually look forward to seeing the atlas grow over time. Now, this brings us to the bit you have all been waiting for, the question and answer session with all our presenters. Now, our presenters are here in the studio. They're ready to answer your questions on their talks. Now, remember, if you've still got a question, make sure you put it on the Q&A panel on your screen and include the name of the presenter you'd like to ask. Now, I'll start with our first question. This is uh, for Andrew. Now, most of the salt storage areas are remote. Um, from end users of the hydrogen, are there any closer to population or industry centres? Okay, thanks, Christina. This is a question that I actually get quite a lot. Um, yeah, it is true in Australia where our salt um, it does seem to be sort of um, in isolated um, locations. That said, we do have salt in central uh, Queensland so that's very good, also down at the Air Peninsula, that also looks um, quite close. Um, in the Canning Basin, yeah, it's, it's maybe um, a little bit far away. Um, that said, that you know, you have to also consider when we compare it to our natural gas system, right, and the, where our natural gas is stored. So our natural gas is stored underground around Australia, and the largest storage of underground, um, of natural gas underground around Australia is in Moomba, in central Australia. So that's a long, long way away from Sydney. And in fact, there's a pipeline called the Moomba um, Sydney Pipeline, and that's where Sydney gets its natural gas from. So that's like thousands of kilometres away, pretty much. So, you know, I don't think it's a limitation. It would be ideal if the links were better and they were better co-located, but, you know, Australia is a very large continent and we have quite experienced moving gas around. Thanks for that, Andrew. Very interesting. Um, look, I'll keep going. Um, this one's for you, Andrew, again, and it's from Alex Succo. Um, how much fresh water do you typically need for dissolving a salt cavern into a well-suitable salt dome? I didn't know this before, but fortunately we um, 
uh, earlier this year, we linked up with a, um, a salt cavern expert uh, from the US and he provided us this kind of information actually. So you need about seven times the volume of your dome in terms of fresh water. Now, in Australia, that's a lot of water. So what you would typically do in that cir circumstance is you would recycle the water. So you take, you put in the water, bring it back out, desalinate it, and then recycle that water. So by doing that, you could actually reduce the vo total volume of water that you would be required to do that. Still need to dispose of the salt in the end, but yeah, the volume of water is probably not as bad as um, you know, um, people consider. Excellent question for someone to put yeah. forward. Um, Andrew, while you've got the floor, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> this is from Mohammed Hassan. Yeah. You know, what are the key challenges in utilising salt caverns and depleted gas reservoirs for hydrogen storage within Australia? You know, this is considering factors such as geological suitability, infrastructure requirements, regulatory compliance, environmental concerns, and economic feasibility. This is more than a double banger of a question, I was Andrew. Say, this is a pretty, <laughs> pretty long question. Um, look, I, I'll try and answer parts of that question. I think um, the key one, I think, at the moment is you know storage of hydrogen underground isn't a regulated activity in Australia, so the regulations have to be established to enable us to do that as a first, as a first port of call. Um, I mentioned before about the brine and the salts that would be extracted from these type of things. So that would have to be disposed of. Now, if you were at the coast, say potentially down at the Polder Basin, you could potentially dispose of that brine into the ocean. And we have examples of this around the world, around Australia at the moment with our ocean desalination plants, for example, when we want to purify water. We take water from the ocean, we desalinate it, and then we put the brine back into the ocean. So you could have a, you could envisage a similar sort of um, circumstance like that. Um, inland, that's a little bit trickier. And yeah, you really have to consider how, what you're going to do with that salt. One thing is that, you know, purified salt actually can have a commercial um, uh, value to it. And potentially you could extract potash out of some of these salt things, which also would have a commercial value. Um, but otherwise, other options would be to dispose of the brine into another, f um, into like a uh, sort of saline aquifer. So that could be another option potentially. But, Thank yeah. Thanks, Andrew. There's a lot to consider and I know we only touched a few um, there, but um, I'm sure that is a matter that is being considered um, much broadly across government as we speak. Um, now, I've got a question here for you, Evgeny. This one's from Richard Blewett. Um, can you see the K enrichment in the radiometrics and the CA and NA enrichment in the ML generated major oxide predicted maps? Okay, Richard. So as to the first part of the question, yes, we do see a correlation between potassium enrichment and the radiometrics in the southeastern part of the Great Amarcasm Mount uh, Isa uh, system. Uh, but the rest of our basically units, they're uh, quite deeply buried and we don't see their uh, superficial expression. Uh, as to the second part, actually no, we didn't make any attempts to make this comparison yet, but thank you for the idea. It's something that will certainly follow up. Thanks for that, Evgeny. Look, while you've still got the floor, Evgeny, uh, another question here from Anna Petz. Uh, Thanks, great talk. Um, Anna would really love to know if there are similar trends in the high-logged minerals too for the two basins, uh, maybe with Stuart's shelf in mind, but also MacArthur. It would be really cool to see the mobilisation. Okay, so basically to some extent here, unfortunately, it would be apples and oranges because they're um, uh, sampling uh, program, uh, they were designed in slightly different uh, uh, manner. So Stuart Shelf project is essentially a COVID remote project and all the sampling was guided by uh, high logger. So as a result, we have a good grounds for comparison. But in case of their uh, Makasa, we have only sort of uh, episodical, occasional uh, data for comparison. Yes, it will be great, but uh, we are not there yet. Thank you. But some potential to consider into yeah, the future. 
Um, Evgeny, look, Richard blew it again. Um, why is there no lead and zinc stripping in the Stuart Shelf mafic rocks compared to the northwest Queensland example? Now, Richard has said he assumes no galena or saffalorite, he's doing this on purpose to me, has been described from the Stuart Shelf. Is it fluid chemistry, temperature and or differences in the source itself? Have you done the work on the fluid chemistry and isotopes in the Stuart's shelf area? I'll let you work that one out, Evgeny. Okay, there are actually lots of questions in one. Uh, uh, yes. We'll start with uh, copper. Copper would behave slightly differently geochemically compared to uh, lead and zinc. Essentially, it's uh, more mobile and it uh, can occur in two uh, valence states. And I don't think we can get a, a unique answer here, but it might be as simple as different uh, fluid to rock uh, ratio or looking at different parts of the system. No, we didn't make any uh, comprehensive modeling for Stuart uh, shelf yet. To some extent, it's due to the fact that the sampling program and the analytical program was completed only recently. And right now, we're just at the stage of uh, uh, data releases and uh, uh, complete interpretation would be completed uh, a bit down the track. Uh, either hopes, yes, but not to the same extent as it was done in the Greater Makassar Basin. Well, thank you for that, Evgeny. Um, Sarah, we've got a question here for, for you from Andrew McPherson. Again, great talk. Um, Andrew would like to ask, what advantages the tasseled cap products have over other vegetation indices, such as NDBI? Um, hi, Maka. Thanks for the question. Um, so the first advantage is that the tasseled cap products are available nationally. They're accessible. Um, you can get, get online and download them for your area um, from Digital Earth Australia. Um, wherever you're, wherever you're working, uh, the scripts that um, we, I should say, Penny developed um, through this particular piece of work are also available on GitHub. Um, so it's a very accessible product. Um, so that's the accessibility perspective. From a scientific perspective, the tasseled cap products. Um, are slightly different to something like the NDVI. So the, the NDVI requires uh, a drying period um, for comparison with um, a wet period, whereas the tasseled cap, so it's you know highly applicable in areas such as Eastern Australia where we've got the ENSO index, which creates um, droughts and, and wet periods, um, which allow comparison. Um, some climate zones might not have those distinct dry and wet periods for, for comparison of indices, um, but the tasseled cap products um, don't require that. So they're a 30 year summary. Um, so they, and we're still in the testing phase. Um, they may prove to be more useful in, in some ecosystems and, and climate zones. Oh, thanks for that, Sarah. Um, a question here from, for Jane. On one of your slides, you mentioned predictive mapping. How can we use what you're learning from your detailed site characterizations to start to model or predict first pass prospectivity? Oh, that's an excellent question. Thanks, Christina. Um, so I guess uh, what, would, what we're really understanding from our detailed site um, characterization is getting a sense of what we're seeing as a result of that mining. So what is, what is going into the product? and what is being left behind in, in the waste. Understanding what's in the waste means that we can start to extrapolate um, using some of the other work that we're doing. Uh, critical minerals in ores comes to mind, so work that we're doing with the uh, Critical Mineral Mapping Initiative uh, and looking at, at understanding what are the critical minerals in our ores and then how do we extrapolate what we see in the waste and marry the two so that we can really understand what we can find in that waste so that we can go to sites or understand what's in some sites that we haven't managed to access or sample and predict what might actually be there. 
it's really an exciting time, and it's like um, like Sarah's work in the tasseled cap. We we're in the beginning stages, and we can see how it can feed into um, how you can utilise it and how best to utilise it. So yeah, no, very exciting, and it's the you know hopefully we'll be in a better better ability to predict or utilise it in a better mode. Sarah, um, you have another question here from Damien Newham. Um, do you see these assessments being suitable for reg regulator compliance alone? That is, the bomb has potential for GDEs, et cetera, which we find cannot be suitable unless ground truthing is undertaken. Um, thanks, Damien, for that question. Uh, I'm not going to say a remote sensing data set will ever be suitable alone. Um, it will always require integration with some ground validation data. Um, I think some of the data that we were using, groundwater levels, for example, um, can be used to increase confidence in the remote sensing assessment. Um, so that was something that was um, done as part of this work and, and is in that report. Um, but we do, in this field, uh, in general, need better integration of ground-based methods with remotely sensed um, methods. There's no um, shortcut around that, and we're just trying to contribute to the um, suitcase, I suppose, of remote sensing tools, uh, make them more accessible. And, and, and that's right. It's part of a package of tools that um, companies and others can use as part of um, considerations of their compliance requirements. Um, look, Sarah, I've got another question for you from um, Baskran. Uh, thanks, Sarah, again, for a great talk. Can you please provide some information on how do products and science outputs such as these feed into the management of GDEs across Australia? OK, thank, thanks, Baskran. Um, good question. So I guess the products that we produce um, and, and scientific products are the start of a pipeline um, that leads to management of GDEs. Uh, the states have their own um, requirements for identification and protection of GDEs, and that varies um, between states. Uh, I guess in this particular case, we're working in New South Wales. Um, so in New South Wales, what we call high priority GDEs are uh, protected um, in legislation through the Water Management Act, um, and then that is enacted through provisions um, in the water management plans for each area. Um, and then New South Wales has a um, required framework for the identification of potential GDEs and their classification as um, high priority or not. Um, so we feed into the very start of that pipeline. Um, the identification um, of potential GDEs uh, and um, yeah so we're trying to make those products more accessible. Well thanks for that Sarah. Um, Jane I've got a question here from Richard Blewett. Uh, have you looked at fly ash from coal power generator stations? Coal is a sponge for lots of metal goodies. I assume not all goes up the smokestack. Yeah, actually, thank you for the question, Richard. We have actually started to look at coal ash, um, and at uh, future releases, we'll, we'll be able to provide you some more information. Um, uh, we've had uh, researchers from the uh, from uh, RMIT University, let's make sure I get the right one, uh, actually uh, sample one of the sites down in Victoria. And I do know that our counterparts at the New South Wales Geological Survey have sampled quite a number of the coal uh, stations or the, the, the uh, fly ash uh, around the Hunter region. So yeah, look, we're looking forward to seeing what, what the results are. So watch this space. Absolutely watch this space. Um, Evgeny, we've got another question for you and it's, um, you talked about how to read the signature of mineral systems in regional geochemistry data sets and compared Stuart's shelf and Mount Isa. Now, do you think we know now enough about the system to roll out this approach to screen frontier basins with no known mineralisation for their resource potential? I think that yes, we 
know enough, and I guess the empirical approach that we suggested and in terms of very simple uh, summary box plot geochemical diagrams, uh, it's an extremely efficient empirical approach and very simple, that's actually what's good. We just need uh, more samples from these uh, frontier basins. I guess it gets us impetus to go to our rock store and resample and uh, reanalyze or analyze uh, a lot of new, new stuff, but yeah. Exciting potential. Uh, Evgeny, we'll keep going. Uh, Mirella Taronis, she wants to thank you for your talk. Now, can you also provide some more information about what geochemistry regarding analysis has been done in the Stewart's shelf? Uh, overall, it's comprehensive geochemical analysis, uh, including uh, major and uh, trace elements. Uh, trace elements mostly analyzed by uh, laser ICPMS, but also by a number of different methods. So we are preparing uh, two data releases. So basically one is a bit late for this showcase, unfortunately, but essentially the data will be available uh, within a couple of weeks from now, I believe. So again, watch the space and uh, you basically have a, a pretty good uh, description of what has been done and uh, the data itself. Oh, thank you. Um, Andrew, we've got another question for you. Now you've mentioned water supply and brine management and disposal in passing in your talk. Now, how water intensive is hydrogen generation and storage and what are some of the associated management considerations such as brine management and disposal? Okay, uh, yeah, well, th theoretically, if you're going to produce hydrogen using renewable energy, you're going to um, use electrolysis. You know, the theoretical minimum is about nine litres of water per kilogram of hydrogen. But in reality, it's going to be much higher than that. And I think there's been some studies to suggest it could be in the order of sort of 20 to 30 litres per, lit per kilogram of hydrogen. So that's if you go down that pathway. If you're using fossil fuels um, with carbon capture and storage, you use less water, um, especially if you're using uh, um, uh, natural gas as your source because there's already hydrogen in the natural gas, right? So you actually don't use as much water. So yeah, it really depends on uh, which technique you're using to produce the hydrogen. Uh, there have been some studies, I think, um, yeah, where they sort of compared the amount of water that would be required if we replaced our entire LNG exports with hydrogen. What, what would be the embodied amount of water? And it was, it was still significantly less than a lot of um, other major industries in Australia. So it's not super large and... Um, well, it's a large amount of water, but um, I guess most of the hydrogen projects, the big ones at least, are looking on coastal regions and they'll probably be going down the ocean desalination pathway for their water resource. Okay. Um, now, brine, well, I guess I kind of discussed brine last time about the different options there about potentially ocean disposal of the brine. Um, and. Um, using it as a product or if it's inland, potentially um, re-injection of the brine into um, subsurface aquifers. Yeah. Thank you for that, Andrew. Yeah. Um, look, thank you everyone um, for tuning in for us on this session. We're actually going to draw the question and answer session to a close here. I specifically want to thank Sarah, Jane, Andrew and Evgeny um, for being part of this panel and for their presentations today. And I also want to thank you, everyone who has attended today's session. If you would still uh, like to ask a question or make contact, um, please email us at eftf at ga.gov.au. And if you have missed anything from today's session or would like to re-watch something, the recordings can be found um, on our showcases webpage, which is at ga.gov.au backslash showcase. Thank you. Um, the, re the, showcase, you know, if you, the showcase is still going to continue. We've got one more session. It commences at 2.30 p.m. It will be our final session, and it is on resources potential. If you are not registered for that session, it's not too late. You can still register using the link on the showcase webpage. 
Thank you again for attending and we look forward to seeing you again shortly.